that. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17 today as we finish part two now of this message that the Lord has been pushing in my heart. And it's titled, When the Brook Runs Dry. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, the word of God says, Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe of Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God that I serve, <laughs> there will be no dew, no rain during the next few years until I give the word. And the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide. Hide by Kerith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from that brook and eat what the ravens bring you. For I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. He camped beside the Kerith Brook, east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening. And he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up. Say it one more time. After a while, the brook dried up. There was no rainfall anywhere in the land. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to go on, but I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this church service today. And Father, there are many here today that feel like they're in a dry place, a dry season, not knowing what's next. And Father, you taught us last week that you are the God who provides. You are the God that's one step ahead of us, always, always working. So whether our lives are up or down, you are still God and remain faithful and true. So Father, as we go to this second part, I pray you would open up our hearts and our ears to understand. And Father, bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated as we get ready for this word this morning. Allow me to drink some water here today. I got a little, <clears throat> little thing going here. You guys ready for this word? We were going in, I was reading last week this sermon that I cut in half. And I was going to teach you guys about that clay illustration that I had last week, but I'm going to do that next Sunday. I know you guys came here for that one, but I might do that next Sunday. Because something interesting happened this week as I was baking banana bread. Did you guys know your pastor bakes a really awesome banana bread? Uh, yeah, I'll try this after. Try it, try it, watch. But this week I was baking some banana bread. And I was noticing as I was baking this banana bread, I was putting all the ingredients necessary into a bowl. So obviously I would put the water, the flour, the eggs, the oil, all of that good stuff inside the bowl. And I started mixing it up with everything that I needed to bake a banana bread. And I was baking this banana bread. I put everything inside. And when I was done mixing it and mixing it and mixing it, it was all in there in the bowl. And I stopped for a moment and I realized something that really hit me hard that I think is for the season that we're in in our church. Maybe this is something you can relate to. But as I looked inside this bowl, I realized that everything that I needed to make banana bread was already put inside the bowl. But just because it was inside the bowl did not mean that it was banana bread. So imagine if I go to bake banana bread, I'm going to bring you a visit your house and I'm going to bring you a banana bread. You say, Pastor, when you come over, make me some of that that famous Pastor David banana bread. And I'm like, sure. And if I show up to your house with a bowl, with all the ingredients, and I give you the bowl just like it is, you would say, uh, Pastor, where's the banana bread? Pastor, you, fin you, you didn't finish it. 
And I would say, yeah, I didn't finish it, but I thought this was good enough. You would say, Pastor, you misled me. You promised me real, delicious, amazing banana bread, but all you brought me were the ingredients. And I want to tell you, church, this morning, this is how God works. You see, God has already put inside you everything you need to accomplish the will He has for your life. God has already put inside you the gifts and the talents and the abilities. He's given you the vision. He's given you the desire. That's why within you, inside you, there's something that says, I have it in me to do this one day. I have a vision for me to have this and to accomplish this. I have a gift. I have a talent. I have this desire. It's inside of me because the Word of God says that before you were even formed, I already knew you. And before you were even born, the Bible says, I knit you together. So everything from your personality to your gifts, to your abilities, to everything that makes you who you are has been put there by God. Isn't that wonderful, church, that inside you right now is everything you need to accomplish what God has for you. Everything is inside you. But just because it's inside you doesn't mean you're ready. And that's a lesson that Elijah's going to learn. Elijah has been called by God to preach the Word of God. And with that calling came this amazing ability for Elijah to stand and preach the Word. It was an anointing. It was the Spirit of God upon Elijah that gave him the ability to preach and do miracles. Elijah had a gift. Elijah would see visions. Elijah had discernment because God put all of that inside him. And one day Elijah would preach in front of thousands and fire would come down from heaven and everyone would see that God was real and God was God. One day Elijah would do miracles like no one has ever seen before. Elijah would stand before kings. Elijah would stand before nations. Elijah would preach even in the New Testament on the mountain of configuration. Elijah would stand with Jesus. God had all of these plans For Elijah, God had given him all these gifts and talents and ability and desires. It was inside, but just because it's inside you doesn't mean you're ready. And Elijah would have to learn. Elijah would have to grow. Elijah would have to go through some things so that whatever God put inside him would grow stronger. This is why so many of us, we get frustrated. We get so frustrated because like Elijah, maybe God today has put a calling upon your life and you're saying, Pastor, I know that I'm called to do this. And I remember as a young man, when I felt the calling to ministry, And my mom would take me to conferences and I would see pastors preaching. I would sit there and I would look at them and say, I know I'm called to do that. But church, if I would have walked up on stage, hey, let me preach now, they would have thrown me out. Wasn't ready yet. Maybe God has given you a special ability, a talent, a gift. Maybe inside you right now there's a vision. And you can see yourself doing this. You can see yourself accomplishing this. And I hear people tell me, Pastor, it's in me. It's inside me. But you're frustrated because you tend to think that just because it's in you, it means God has to do it right now. And God is going to put desires in you that are actually His. And God's going to put special anointing on you that's His. And God's going to put it inside you. But don't make the mistake 
of thinking just because it's inside me. It has to happen now. It has to happen now, God. You see, you might say, Pastor, it's in me to be married one day. And you're frustrated because you're still single. But you get mad because you see other people married. And you say, I know I'm called to do that. I'm such a better wife than she is. I'm prettier than she is. And I don't know why I'm still single. It's in me to be the best wife ever. And God says, it's in you because I put it in you. But you're still single because you ain't ready yet. Well, it's in me to be a parent. It's in me to be a father. It's in me to be a mom. And you see other parents, and man, I will do so much better. And I will be the best mom ever, the best dad. But you're still not having children because God says, I put that desire in you, but you're not ready. You have a desire for a business idea. And you see other businesses, and you say, man, my idea is better. And my idea will go circles around this. It's in me. But why don't I get a shot? Why don't the doors open? Why don't no one see this? Why can't anyone recognize this gift I have? Because God says, it's in you. Because I put it there. But you're still not ready. It's in you. But just because it's in you doesn't mean you're ready. And Elijah would have to learn this. Elijah would have all these gifts and abilities in him. But he wasn't ready. Why is that? Can I be so blunt and honest this morning? God has put all these good things in you. The ability, the power, the talent, the love, the passion, the kindness, the goodness. The Bible says every perfect, every perfect gift comes from God from above. He put it inside you. But you know what else is inside you? Sin. Because we miss the mark with God. We all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Can I get an amen to that? That's the problem with us today. Along with all the things God has put in you, there are other things in you that God says, that's not me. God might have put all this passion in you, but inside you, there's also lust. God put all these good things in you, but inside you, there's also bitterness, ungratefulness, jealousy, anger, rage, immorality, selfishness. And God says, listen, before I can do what I've called you to do, and before you can see everything that's inside you that I put there, I got to do a work inside you. I got to work in your heart. I have to work on your character. Because if I do it right now, that pride that's inside you is going to destroy it because before destruction comes pride. And I can't do it now because if I give you that husband now that's in you to be a good wife, but you don't deal with that bitterness and that lack of trust, when that man comes into your life, that nasty thing that's in you is going to ruin that marriage. And I I can't give you that child yet because right now in you, you got to be tough to be a parent. you got to be strong to be a parent. But right now there's a weakness and a fear in you that if I don't give you that, if I would give you that child right now, your parenting wouldn't be effective. And I want to give you that promotion. I want to give you that job. I want to give you that career. I want to give you that. But see, inside you, 
that nasty thing. I got to work in this. I got to work in this. So God says, I'm not going to do it yet. I'm going to put everything you need inside you to do what I called you to do. But before I can bring that, I got to work in you. You know what the problem with a lot of people in church today is? Go ahead, reply. What's the problem, Pastor? Tell me. Go ahead. All right, the problem is you. The problem is me. We want God to do a work in our lives. Amen? We say, Lord, would you work this out? Lord, would you work that out? Lord, would you work on my spouse? Would you work in my kids? Would you work in my finances? But when was the last time you really prayed, Lord, will you work in me? Lord, will you deal with me? Because you'll be surprised how many things in your life will work out when God finishes working in you. And sometimes the answer you're looking for is actually inside you. God has to work in you. Let me prove this to you. Let me prove you're not ready. He says, I know I'm not ready. I love that guy. Philippians 1.6. Notice what the Bible says. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work, where? In you. Say it with me. He who began a good work in you. One more time. In you. He who began a good work in you will carry it out into completion until the day of the Lord Christ Jesus. Here's the problem. We have misquoted this verse. We have taken it out of the context. And people have preached this completely false. They have taken this verse to mean God's going to finish what he started. And when we look at this, we say, oh, amen, hallelujah. He's going to finish what he started. My job, my career, my life, my future. God's going to finish it. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is going to finish the work that's in you. God has to work in you. And God will continue to work in you until he's finished. So right now, God is looking at you and he's saying, I see that temper of yours. I mean, you got a temper. And you see that temper and that temper is going to give you a bad testimony. That temper is going to destroy your marriage. That temper is going to destroy your life. That temper of yours is a bad attitude. And I got to work in that and work in that and work in that. And God's going to allow circumstances in your life and bring teachings to your life and bring circumstances upon circumstances so that he works in that temper of yours. And God will never say, oh, that's it. I give up. I can't help this temper. I can't work on this temper. You're too much. God says, no, I'm not going to give up until I finish that temper out of you. I'm going to finish the work that's inside you. And many people want God to work in their life. But don't work in me, God. Lord, I want you to work in my family. I want you to work in my marriage. I want you to work and everything outside. But don't work inside me. But there are things inside us that God looks at and says, I need to work on that. How many of you by just a faithful, good old Baptist confession said, Pastor, are there are things in me I know God needs to work on. Don't sit here holy. Don't look at your neighbor, your spouse, and say, he's talking to you. God looks at you like I looked at those ingredients and I said, man, you're not ready. Because there's things in you I have to work on. God might have to work on your selfishness. God might have to work on your impatience. 
God might have to work on that prideful, arrogant attitude that you're so prideful that you can't admit it. He might have to work on that attitude and such. You see, all of us are here in church because God is doing a work in us. We don't all have it together. We all haven't arrived. Everyone you see next to you right now, all around this church, God is working in them. How does God work inside you? Most people would say the Christian answer through the church. Bible, prayer, worship. Let's be honest. The devil does all of that. The devil does all of that. You don't think the devil comes to church? Look at your neighbor. <laughs> I'll tell you every this is the first member of Fuller Fellowship Church was like he was, it was Satan. The first member, the second I walked into that movie theater and that front row was Satan. Says nice church you got there. And for 13 plus years, he's been my most faithful member. The devil goes to church. The devil prays. The devil don't pray. Yeah, what's prayer? Talking to God? Did the devil ever talk to the Lord? Hello? Oh, I just need to pray for change. I just got to go to church. The devil goes to church. The devil prays. Oh, you want to talk about worship? The devil was a worship leader. The devil knows the word. He quoted it to Jesus. And that's why so many of you are going to keep coming to church and never change. You're going to keep praying and seeing nothing. You're going to sing the songs and see no progress. You're going to memorize the verses and still stay stuck. Why? Well, Pastor, that's not very encouraging. But it's the truth. If I'm really being honest, and I might get an email from this online, some of the meanest people I've ever met were so-called Christian. Churchgoers. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Where my Pereira family at? Amen? I had my truck vandalized in the church parking lot from a Christian because he didn't like the way I preached. Some of the meanest, most critical, hateful people are members of a church. Don't tell me that all you need is church to change. The church will not change you because God can change you. It's not prayer. It's not the scriptures. Those are things you do to learn and to grow. But you want to know where the real change happens? You're not going to like it. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy. My brothers, my brethren, my sisters, my Christians. Whenever you face what? Trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith developed perseverance. Perseverance must what? Finish its what? Work. Where is the working at? The trials inside you. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking anything. Where are my mature Christians at? You're not mature because you pronounce it that way. You're not mature because I know the revelations and the Deuteronomy studies and I know the book of Exodus back and forth. I've memorized the book of Psalms 
and yet there you are in the office gossiping. God says, I do a work in you through trials. No one likes trials. But God says, if you only knew that that trial you're going through is what I'm using to work inside you. So when you're going through one of the hardest seasons of your life, that is me working in you. And when you're going through loneliness and you're going through betrayal and you can't pay the bills and you're living with fear and you don't know what's next and you can't get a break in life and you're breaking apart and you're falling apart and life is just hard and everything's against me, God says, consider it pure joy. God did not say, consider it a time of depression and give up and just give up on life. No, God says, consider this a moment of joy because you know that that trial you're going through is actually working in you. I'm growing you through this trial. Because God says it's through this trial I'm finishing the work. I'm maturing you. That word maturing literally means to grow. People say, well, ever since I've been in church, I've grown. No, you haven't. Church only prepares you for the trial. Worship prepares you for the trial. Everything you learn is for the trial you're about to face. Because it is the trials of life that God says, I use to mature you, to grow you in the faith. So you keep coming to church and learning and growing because when the trial comes, you're going to say, oh, Pastor David taught me this. I'm ready for this. He warned me about this. That's why when you look at the bowl and you see all the ingredients inside, what's next, church? The heat of the oven. And I put it in that oven. Because I want to change it. You ever notice you put batter into an oven and something different comes out? You're asking God, change me, please change me. God says, I'm trying to, but every time I put you in the oven, you scream. Every time I put you in the oven, you question me. Every time I put you in the oven, you give up. Every time I put you in the oven, you throw a pity party. Every time I put you in the oven, you sit alone in isolation and cry and tell me how hard your life is. Every time I try to change you through the trial, you walk out on me. Real change is in trials. When I put that sucker in the oven, I set a timer. I set the degree because I know how much it could handle. And I wait. See, there's a process that God says is going to take time. Things are going to get hot. It's going to be uncomfortable. But I'm watching. And you're in this because I know you can handle it. And when you come out, you won't be the same ever again. You're going to see that you're going to come out different. And this will never come back to battle. That is true transformation. That I will never go back to the old me. That part of me is gone. That part of me is dead. That's why God says rejoice in the trial. Because that trial is working in you to the point that when God is finished, you will never go back to that old sin of yours. 
Is this making sense tonight, church? There's a process. And Elijah had everything in him. The gifts to preach. The power to do miracles. God was going to use him that the whole nation, the whole world would know who he is. But before God could even do anything in his life, he said, Elijah, i got to put you through some seasons. Through some trials. In church, like Elijah, God's going to put you through a season. Various trials means various seasons. That he's doing a work in you to ready you. And that's why I think I look back and I say, wait a minute. See, in my living room, there's a picture frame of the first Sunday I started Forward Fellowship. And I have this smile I haven't seen in 13 years. Because we had these great expectations and it would be awesome and everything. You should see it. It's so cute. I have little long hair. It was cute. I have my Bible. It's high. Right now. In the morning, as I was praying, I looked at that picture and said, if I could talk to that person right now, I would tell him, hold on. Because you're going to go through things. And we went through it as a church, amen. We had a car go through it. Maria burned it down once. Crazy. Let me not tell you about the people that come to our church. We've moved more places than the Israelites. The Israelites moved. We were like all over Miami. We've gone through it as a church. And, I, and you know my mistake was assuming that every problem was the devil. And I feel like I owe the devil an apology because he might look at me and say, that wasn't me. Oh, that one was, but that one, that wasn't me. And God has allowed things to happen in your life because he's working in you. And all of you that know me and our family and everyone that's been in church, we're not the same church we used to be when we started. Because that's what trials do. Elijah would learn what we need to learn. God's going to put you through a series of trials to work in you. Why? Because before God can work through you, he has to work in you because there's things in you that if he doesn't work in, it's going to mess up what God actually wants to do through you. The first season that God's going to do in your life, it's easy. Next week, I'll talk about the hard stuff. Can I talk the easy stuff right now? Because I, I started praying for you guys and I realized a lot of us are failing in the easy things. Here's the first season we'll talk about this Sunday. Look at verse 2 through 4. And the Lord said to Elisha, go to the east and, say a word with me, hide. 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 Hide by the Kirith brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. Hide. What does it mean to hide, church? Let's really put our thinking caps on. What does it mean to hide? It means that when you're hiding, no one is going to see you. And Elijah had all these gifts and talents and abilities, and no one saw him. You're going to feel a season in your life of loneliness. No one sees me. I'm abandoned. No one notices me. No one cares. I have so much in me, but no one sees it. And God says, I've called you to preach. You're going to go to the nations. You're going to stand by Christ. You're going to be in the presence of kings. You're going to do miracles, Elisha. 
You're going to see fire from down from heaven. You're going to bring revival, Elisha. But for now, I'm going to hide you. No one's going to see you. No one's going to recognize you, give you recognitions. No one's going to applaud you. No one's going to notice you. You're just going to be in a season of hiding. And what I found out in the Bible was that oftentimes the things that God had for someone that were mighty, he put them through a season of hiding first. David was anointed to be king of Israel, but he had to hide for years in case. Are you listening? Moses had a great call on his life to save the Israel, but there came a point that his mom couldn't hide him anymore. He was hidden. And when he got older, for 40 years, he was hidden in the desert where no one could find him. Gideon was called to be a great warrior, but the Bible says he was hiding on the hills. And the mountains. Even when Jesus was born, who better to have the greatest calling than Jesus Christ? Who? No one. But yet when he was born, God told Mary and Joseph, go to Egypt and hide. It's hard. When God has put something in you, but no one sees it. It's hard when you know it's in you, but no one cares. And God has you in a season of hiding. Why? Because Elijah wasn't ready. And God had to give him a small test first. A small test. Just a little little test. Before I can do more, Elijah, I want to hide you for a little bit. I know you're gifted. I put that there. I know you have a calling. I put that there. I know you see the vision. I put that there. I know you have the power. Boy, I put that in you. But I'm going to hide you. Because I want to work something out in you. And it's a little test, Elijah. And if I can see you pass this little test, I'll promote you to the next level. How many want God to take you to the next level? You probably won't, though. Because you can't pass this test. You want to know what the test is? You want to know? We look at this verse and say, Pastor, last week was awesome. You preached about provision, and that's true. I mean, we're blessed last Sunday. Now listen, let me tell you the full sermon. It was awesome that Elijah was fed by a raven. Bread and meat, morning and night. That was awesome. We said that was God's provision. That was amazing. God made a way, even during a famine, even during a drought. God commanded a bird, everyone. He commanded a bird to bring him a sandwich, meat and bread, morning and night. And that's amazing. That's Yes, God is good. God provides. He's He's Jehovah Jireh. He's there. He's taking care of you. Amen, right? But listen to me, church. If Howard was in that brook, the first day that bird brings meat and bread, you're like, wow! This is a miracle. This is awesome. The next morning, this is great. Look, he did it again in the morning at night. And for a whole week, you're like, wow, this is amazing. Look how God takes care of us. And then one month later, same bird, same meat, same bread. Two months later, same bird, same meat, same bread. Three months later, same bird, same meat, same bread. You say, oh, yeah, mom, is there anything else? Lord, can you, ah, that that raven's looking pretty delicious now. Because I'm tired of this meat. And Lord, I'm, I'm trying to be grateful here, but every day is the same thing. And when I open my eyes in the morning, I look at that little raven with the same thing. 
And then at night, he comes back with the same thing. Bread, eat. Church, this went on for three and a half years. How many of you are tired of the same thing? You're tired of the same. Every day, Lord, the same thing. The same job. The same problem. But the same people going to work in the same routes, going home to the same spouse, going to the same kids. Nothing changes. God, it's all the same. I'm tired of the same, the same, the same. For three and a half years, God provided the same thing, and God said nothing. God didn't say, listen, it's going to change. I'm going to do things better. One day, you're going to have a widow cook for you. It's going to be a lot better than this. Trust me. Like, no, God stays silent. And that is one of the most difficult trials you're going to go through, is that season of same and silence. And you're saying, God, is there more? God, is this it? God, is it ever going to change? Why would God put him to this brook to hide and eat the same thing for three and a half years, for 42 months. He was tested. When I took my banana bread out of the oven, I asked Jerrica, Is it ready? It looks ready. She says, stick it. (laughs) Get a toothpick and poke it. What's that? Oh, no, 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 this is not ready. And I put it back in the oven. A little poke. A little, just, just, no anything. Little. That's what God does. You're not going to always have these huge trials that you're like a martyr. You're not going to have those late night prayer worship like nights from a prison cell like Paul and Peter. Sometimes you're not going to go through these massive storms like the disciples. But you act like you do. And God's just going to give you a little poke. You know what a little poke is, church? Can we preach? Little pokes are the little things in life that irritate you. That frustrate you. It's not the end of the world. But man, it bothers me. And sometimes church, I don't know about you, but this is what my life looks like lately. (laughs) Porcupine bread. This is a potato family. Forward. I'm like, God, give me a bird. Stop poking me. But it's little things. Some of you come here, you poke me. Don't ever poke a bear. But you poke me. How many get poked? Little things. You say, God, what? Little things. You're driving. Person gets right in front of you only to slow down. Poke. You're listening to worship, but then you blow your testimony. You know how you blow it. The horn? Nah. (laughs) 
Little pokes. Little things. How many of you are just tired of dumb people? Just dumb people. Just dumb people. My mom asked me, my mom asked me this week to go to a place and she had bought River, this big blue plastic pool. You guys remember growing up with those big plastic pools? And I, I go there, I, I'm, I'm late, I'm, I have to go because I'm going to church. I got to teach the Bible, right, on Wednesday. And I'm there, and it's a young girl, Generation Z. You got to pray for these people. Because I, I, I go there with the receipt as I'm here to pick up a pool. And she says, okay. She walks. And guys, I'm not kidding you. She checks the online bin. It's a little locker. She opens and she goes, it's not here. Poke. The guy behind me, an older gentleman, he's like, is she serious? And then I said to her, did you check the drawer? Just making fun of her. She goes, no. That was in a hurry. Poke. Every day, little someone is going to slip a tooth. But you, you don't really get mad at the littlest things. You know, when you're going to the supermarket and someone leaves the car right in the middle and walks off. Ah! <sighs> How many of you have something in your life that just pokes you? But you know that God doesn't always bring you these severe trials. It's the little things to see if you're ready. But see, what happens is most people give up on life and fall apart. Most marriages end, by the way, because of poking. Never huge problems. It's just the little things keep piling in until the last one gets you. This is why people lose it. God has a way of poking you. See if you're ready. He'll put someone in your life that annoys you to see if you're ready. He'll poke you. So if your life looks like this, it's because you're not ready. And every day something's going to poke you. What was Elijah learning? Every day he saw that raven, God poked him. And Elijah could have been frustrated. He could have been angry. He could have been upset. But here's the amazing thing. God was trying to test him and teach him to see if Elijah would be content and grateful. Why? Because Elijah had to learn that everything he had, even though it was difficult and wasn't the greatest, was a blessing from God. See, everyone has to learn this, including myself. The little things in life that poke you are actually things you should be grateful for. But contentment is one of those things that in our society has been lost. Why? Because within ourselves, we think we deserve more. We're entitled. And the word contentment in the Bible literally means to be satisfied and have peace where God has you. But you know why so many people today, today in our generation right now, we have more than any generation before us. We have it easier than anyone. But today, there are more people depressed. Suicide is at an all-time high. And more and more people are dissatisfied because we have lost that ability to be content. 
because we preach this in, the, in our world today. You need to have more. you got to have the best, the newest, the latest. Have more, more. Be ambitious. Go. Work hard. Aim your goal. Climb the ladder. Get more. And that's all okay. Ambition is fine. But if your ambition causes you to be discontent, God's going to keep poking until you realize that everything in your life that irritates you, that pokes you, that gets you angry are things you are no longer grateful for. Can I prove it to you? I told Jerrica this morning, I know there are things I do that poke you. I said, I know that sometimes I leave the toilet seat up and when she puts it down, there's pee in it, on it. I know I leave socks on the, on the ground. I know I could be messy. But I said, but, but babe, every time I poke you, every time I do something that just pokes you, that's just a reminder that you're married. And then I said, you are, you're welcome. <laughs> it's just a reminder. So when you, when, you know, when you're saying, Lord, pray, where is he? Lord, bring him to me. And then he brought him to you and he's a mess. And you're like, ah, I can't believe I'm married. Why did I get married? Every time he pokes me. Everything you get that pokes you is something you should say thank you. Because someone woke up today widowed. Everything. But what happens to us is we're entitled. Jericho pokes me too. I'm married to a Hispanic woman. I just want to say this. I just want to say this. Why do ladies put underwear in the shower. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? All my Hispanic girls, where you at? And I'm going in the shower, I'm like, what is this? It's poke. But it's a reminder. That wife I prayed for for 10 years has a rocket. <laughs> She's home. Every little thing that pokes you, something you should be grateful for. That's what he was teaching Elijah. You're going to come to church and things are going to poke you. Let me prove it to you that all of us are so entitled and ungrateful. When you woke up this morning, did you thank God? Don't pretend. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. And then when you got up and you got dressed, you got dressed with clothes you bought, with money you got from your job, you ate. Do you know that job that pokes you? That boss you work for? The employees you can't stand? The every day the same thing? It's a job that you should be grateful for. Because Elijah, it might be just bread and meat and a brook of water, but that's way more than everyone else who's going through a famine has right now. You're complaining. It's so hot. So hot. And you're saying this in your air-conditioned home and car. That's more than a third of the world has. We're blessed. Oh, but it's hot. Yeah, because you're in Miami. Hello, be blessed. You can be in Arkansas somewhere. <laughs> but you get to live here. I don't know why Arkansas. It's just the whitest, the whitest place I can think of. I don't know. <laughs> but everything you have in your life is something you should be content and grateful for. Everything in your life. 
Whatever pokes you is something, an area in your life you have forgotten to say, Lord, thank you. On your way to church, you're in church right now. When even more of a third of the world of church is illegal. But you're entitled. You went to church today. You drank that coffee outside. You didn't say thank you, Lord. I drank that coffee today. I didn't even say thank you to Maria. I was entitled. You say, oh, that's my coffee. Everything you have in your life that might poke you and irritate you is something that God says you should actually be grateful. Be grateful. So Elijah was going through this test because God was saying, I just want to see if you're going to be content. For three and a half years, same thing. And so God said, now you're right. Let me close with Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be what? But notice Paul's honest. I had to learn. You're not born with it. It's a discipline to be satisfied and, read and have peace where God has you. I love that he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. See, God, Paul is saying there's ups and there's downs in every circumstance. You're going to be in need. You're going to be plenty. You're going to be in want. You're going to have enough. That's everything in your life. There is a season up and down. Church, marriage, relationship, everything up and down. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. How many would love that right now? So you can stop living a life of, I want more, I need more. Why do they have? Why not me, Lord? How much longer? Lord, can you do it now? Lord, I wish I had more. I wish I had that. I'm so unhappy. I won't be happy till I have this. This is exactly how the devil wants you to live. Look at the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve. They had enough. They had God. They had each other. They had their needs met. The second the devil slipped in, he said, you don't have it all. You're missing that fruit, that forbidden fruit on the tree. And they were not content. And it brought destruction to their life. Lack of contentment and gratefulness will destroy you if you let it. Be grateful for everything and in every situation. Why? What's the secret? Here it is. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed, there's the up. Or hungry, there's the down. Whether living, there's the up. Or in want, there's the down. I can do everything through Him gives me strength. You know what Paul says here? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is a verse that literally means to depend on God. That's what God was teaching Elisha. With every raven that brought bread and fish every day, Elisha, I'm just testing your dependence on me. With every head bowed and every eye closed today. I don't know what your situation is. You may be up right now. You may be down. You may have plenty. You may be in need. Maybe right now your life it feels like God is just poking you every day. And everything is frustrating you and everything gets you angry and everything annoys you. Why do you want to live like that? 
everything that pokes you should be an area in your life that you should actually be grateful for. But you have lost that ability to be grateful. You have lost that contentment in your life. That's why you're unhappy. That's why you have no peace. Because you have forgotten the God that you depend on. And if God wanted you to have more, he would have given it to you. And maybe he hasn't because you're not ready. Learn to be content. Every day of Elijah's life for three and a half years was hidden and the same. And that must have been so frustrating because Elijah knew he was called for more. Elijah must have told God, you gave me a vision for more. But why am I hidden? Why am I in this small brook? Why has nothing changed? Why is it the same food every day, the same thing? Because God was fasting with a little child just to see if you would depend. Let's all stand to our feet today as we remain in prayer today. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, it feels like everything in my life is just being poked. And there's things in me I know that God is working in. But it doesn't change. It doesn't change. It's the same thing. I'm the same me. I don't change. It could be because you are right now in a place where God is bringing you trials to change you, but you haven't accepted it. God is bringing you trials right now to grow you, but you're still angry. It's not church. It's trials. Church only prepares you for the trial. And the trials you're in right now is not God abandoning you. It's not God forgetting about you. Elijah must have felt forgotten because he was hiding every day with nothing changing. The same thing every day. But there came a point that God said, Elijah, now I can take you to the next level. And I'm here to tell someone this morning, life may be poking you. You may be living irritated, angry, and going through a trial. But with God, you can do all things. You just keep depending on Him and watch Him change the circumstances when He's ready. You're going to come out of it like the banana bread and never be the same again. But you have to learn to trust Him. This is you this morning and saying, Pastor, I'm in a trial right now. Would you put that hand up? Say, Pastor, I'm in a trial. God bless you. God bless you all around the room. in a trial. Whatever your trial is, it might be just a poke. Next week, we're going to talk about when it's not a poke, when it's serious. But today, I want to talk to those that are going through pity problems that are destroying you. That's ruining your testimony, your life, your marriage, your children over little things that God can actually use to grow you with great things. Let me pray for you, church. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every man, woman, and child in this church that's going through a trial. And sometimes the trials are not huge. Father, I pray for those that are going through the little things repeatedly. The little annoyances. The little things that we should be more grateful for. That we have forgotten to say thank you. The little things we complain about. And Father, every day was the same, but every day that raven came with the same thing was another day of provision and blessing. Let us see, Lord. Help us to see that everything in our life is a blessing working in us. 
Father, continue to work in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, you guys can give God some praise today. You guys can be seated today. I want to thank you guys for joining us for part two. I hope you guys were blessed. You guys blessed by that word today? Come on, you guys are going to go out and leave this church. I promise you, I've already prayed it. I said, Lord, poke them this week to death. Poke them everywhere they go. Let something annoy them, frustrate them, get them angry so that they learn this is just a poke. And God's going to use this to make you better. So how you are you expecting and waiting to get poked this week and say, I'm going to get poked? I'm going to get poked. But I want to thank you guys for joining us for this word.